It's been 15 years since the fateful flight of Ship 2075, and the world hasn't gotten any less scary. In fact, we've cranked up the heat quite a bit since then. The Cold War got hot over in Korea, and it's about to go up in an absolute blaze in a little backwater called Vietnam. The bombs are bigger, the planes are faster and more reliable, and America is more ready than ever to clap back at the USSR. And China. And North Korea. And North Vietnam, but we'll get back to that later. Since we last left the boys from SAC, they've incorporated ICBMs, thermonuclear bombs, and the ubiquitous absolute all-star of the bombing world, the mighty B-52. But they aren't the only doomsday delivery boys on the block anymore, now having to share the nuclear budget with the sharp-dressing, fancy-flying aviators of the U.S. Naval Air Forces. Known today as the Chads of United States Air Power, naval aviators got their very own ship-borne nukes to contribute to the radiation death of the human race and they were going to deliver them with style. But in this series, we know that everyone makes mistakes, and the Navy wasn't long in breaking their first arrow during the heady days of the Vietnam War. In 1965, the USS Ticonderoga was taking a break from bombing Vietnam into the Stone Age when another bomb was lost, and this time, it was a big one. So how did the Navy get their own nukes? And hell, how did they survive in the nuclear era at all? Well, I dipped into this topic a little bit in my video on Operation Crossroads, and yes, I know I mention it a lot, I think it's a really interesting topic and you should watch it, thank you. But long story short, the development of longer ranged, faster flying jets made the Carrier Strike Group a terrifying force in the modern warscape. Long range SAC style bombers were still the front line in the nuclear defense plan, but carriers were more tactical and could respond to lower level incidents around the world, something the USA would become increasingly associated with as the years went on, for better or worse. From a practical standpoint, they also provided precision and redundancy to the nuclear plan, especially as the list of nuke-worthy commies increased. If the Navy was delivering soldiers to police a country, you might as well pack some nukes too, just in case. You never know. The carrier had already proven itself in World War II, even if they were a little insecure about it in light of nuclear weapons. In fact, our carrier of interest today was made during the war, being deployed in 1943, the 65th carrier built after the attack on Pearl Harbor, before which the USA only had eight. So yeah, carriers were already pretty important. Hey kid. How about one of those carriers? Just one. <laughs> Ticonderoga first saw combat at Leyte Gulf, and it even bombed Vietnam long before the Vietnam War, having launched raids on Japanese shipping in Saigon in 1944. She also sustained a brutal kamikaze attack, which nearly sank the stubborn vessel, but she survived and would see extensive refits post-war. These refits were thorough and expensive, being nearly as expensive as building a new vessel entirely. Among the myriad changes was removal of most of the ship's defensive armament, as planners of the day rightly figured that the lion's share of naval combat would happen in the air, far away from the carriers that launched the planes. At least they damn well hoped it would. They also added an angled flight deck and, most importantly perhaps, steam catapults for deploying jets. By the time Tycho saw its first deployment in Vietnam, jets had all but supplanted prop planes in the Navy's arsenal. Some of the aircraft that sailed with Tycho in 1965 included the F-8 Crusader, the A-3 Sky Warrior, and the S-2 Subtracker, among other aircraft including support and cargo planes and rescue helicopters. 
Tycho even had a squadron of A-1 Sky Raiders, a prop plane that first deployed in 1946. But most importantly for us, it had two squadrons of A-4 Skyhawks, a light attack aircraft capable of carrying, among other things, the B-43 thermonuclear bomb. The presence of this attack aircraft carrier has been felt half a world away from the United States. Life on an aircraft carrier in 1965 was tough. These ships were loud, cramped, hot, steamy, smoky, and super, super dangerous. It wasn't uncommon for sailors working in engine rooms to get heat exhaustion, and there wasn't much relief to be found elsewhere on the ship. Cases of heat rash were ubiquitous, and even officers had no guarantee of comfort, as very few cabins had air conditioning. Though one such air-conditioned room was the nuclear weapons magazine. Thank God for cold fusion. Of course, enlisted men had it worse, with their bunks being a nearly unbearable 101 degrees while in the Gulf of Tonkin, with only fans and talcum powder providing any kind of relief from the persistent perspiration. And if you were hoping for a cool, refreshing belt of the wet stuff to cool your palate, well then I hope you like the taste of jet fuel, cause Tycho's water supply was thoroughly contaminated with the stuff. Right big. But worse than all of the discomfort was the serious potential for accidental injury aboard ship. Now, I suppose it does come with the territory, and every sailor on board knew, or at least learned fast, how easy it was to get yourself maimed, or worse. Hernias, broken limbs, accidental falls, including falling overboard, walking into propellers, getting sucked into engines, sports injuries, and even a ripped scrotum while simply getting into bed. Carrier living was tough, and these accidents could happen in and out of combat zones. And once the bombing started, it would get even worse. Ticonderoga sailed into the Gulf of Tonkin in 1965, where it had recently taken part in the infamous incident that had occurred there. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Operation Rolling Thunder had kicked off in spring of the same year, starting one of the most, perhaps I might say, obnoxious aspects of the Vietnam War, that being near constant bombing. The US would drop more bombs over Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos than all of the bombs dropped during the entirety of World War II, and Tycho was there to make a contribution to that comical number. Splitting its time between stations Yankee and Dixie, Tycho would fly 10,000 sorties and drop 7,300 tons of ordnance over targets in Vietnam, with aviators taking off day in and day out. The life of a pilot on Tycho was a rough one, too. Apart from the obvious threat of getting shot down, killed, or arguably worse, captured by the NVA or Viet Cong, aviators could expect little relief between bouts with death. The ready room was as hot and sweaty as any on Tycho, and the junior grade quarters were so hot that officers often leapt from their shoes right into the rack to avoid touching the hot floor. These aviators were running on fumes most of the time, barely getting enough rest to make it through the day, and flying through small arms fire and flak, dodging surface-to-air missiles, and sometimes even dogfighting over Southeast Asia. And even takeoffs and landings weren't guaranteed. Landing a jet on a moving airstrip in the middle of the rolling waves is no easy feat, despite how slick it looks in the movies. Pilots often took more than one try to get it right, and Tycho lost more than one aircraft on landings during the winter cruise. My dad's a naval aviator, and he's always been fond of Chuck Yeager's quote, if you can walk away from a landing, it's a good landing. And I think the aviators on Tycho would have agreed with that sentiment. These men weren't in the shit like the grunts, but life for sailors and naval aviators was a harrowing, often deadly experience. This life would take its toll on the most stalwart of seamen, and even everyday tasks might suffer to the merciless drudgery and unstoppable entropy. One of the prime missions of tactical aircraft is the delivery of nuclear weapons following a low-level approach to the target. So the Ticonderoga was in the Gulf of Tonkin to bomb Vietnam, but I already mentioned it had a nuclear weapons magazine on board. But why? Why would an aircraft carrier bound for Vietnam be carrying any number of nukes? It was because the Navy was now an integral part of the United States nuclear strategy. So just because we weren't nuking Nam didn't mean we wouldn't need to nuke China at a moment's notice. And also, the US definitely considered nuking Vietnam and that option was on the table almost until the end of the war. 
Frighteningly enough, the two biggest reasons they never did it were that public perception would have been horrible, of course, and, funny enough, they figured nukes wouldn't have been all that effective against the guerrilla tactics of the Vietnamese. But the US kept the nukes nearby as a good old-fashioned table flip in case things went too sour, or if China or Russia joined the war in force. So at the time, the US military was working off of the Eisenhower-era PSYOPs. No, not those PSYOPs. PSYOP stands for Single Integrated Operational Plan, and there were lots of them. These plans were implemented during a time when there were no overarching strategies for nuclear war, causing fears amongst military leaders that pilots might fly into heavy fallout, bomb an already destroyed target, or get vaporized by another bomber striking at the same time. So the solution was to coordinate the potential targets very carefully and drill constantly to be sure that this symphony of death would crescendo at the right time. For the Navy's part, their ability to move their planes and their runways across the sea made them the perfect branch for striking America's new commies of interest, China. Why China? Well, they were sort of allies with Russia for like two seconds, and as such were considered part of the Soviet bloc. Now, you won't catch me defending China on much of anything, but it does seem a bit severe to nuke them into oblivion even during our retaliation against Russia. And yeah, that was part of the plan. If Russia drove a T-62 across the Fulda Gap in Europe, the U.S. Navy would nuke Peking out of existence. Emergency Communist Acquisition Directive. But how would they achieve this goal? And what planes would be carrying what bombs? Well, there would be several Navy planes capable of carrying nukes, but our plane for the day will be the A-4 Skyhawk, a single-engine light attack jet introduced into service in 1954. The A-4 is considered to be a hallmark of naval aviation, a true workhorse with a great reputation amongst flyers. It was agile, resilient, and apparently a real pleasure to fly. It could carry a variety of weapons, but even before it left the proving stage of its life, the Douglas Company knew it would have to carry nukes. Born during the military nuke boom of the Eisenhower era, the Navy requested firmly that the Skyhawk be capable of delivering the apocalypse. The bomb of choice in 1965 was the B-43 Variable Yield Hydrogen Bomb. Designed by the Los Alamos Laboratory, the B-43 could be delivered with a ribbon parachute to slow its descent, and this was a really good thing for A-4 pilots. The prospect of a carrier-borne nuclear strike in 1965 was a tough one, and many pilots joked that such a mission would almost certainly be a one-way trip. The Skyhawk had an effective range of about 1,100 miles and a top speed of 585 knots. Just for reference, the fireball of a 1 megaton B-43 reaches its maximum size of 5,700 feet across in just 10 seconds. Not a lot of time to get out alive, and the pilots knew it. The planes were fitted with light shields as well, meant to be pulled down inside the canopy before the moment of detonation. This meant that the pilot would need to fly on instruments alone, while fleeing a thermonuclear blast. Use the force, Luke. The other option for the theoretical nuclear aviators was the eye patch method, in which the pilot pulls an eye patch over one eye for the attack, then post blast he would move the eye patch to the other eye and fly half blind. And of course, this is assuming the pilot survives the hard deck scraping run into enemy territory, presumably under fire from ground forces and enemy fighter jets. But hey, the Navy got its slice of a nuclear budget, and that's what matters most. Hello, I like money. And yes, the non-PSYOP nuclear plans aboard Ticonderoga involved dropping one megaton B-43s on bridges and other hard targets in North Vietnam, mainly at the border with China. What were the odds they'd get used? Well, not great, I guess, but good enough for men like Lieutenant Junior Grade Douglas Webster to memorize the plans and even partially rehearse them in his A-4E Skyhawk. Here, in a land bordering on the China Sea, the peace and stability of a small nation is being threatened. Doug Webster was an all-American patriotic aviator from Ohio. He wasn't a warmonger by any stretch, but he believed in what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam, and he wanted to do his part in it as best he could. Webster wasn't a perfect pilot either, but he had successfully flown 17 sorties into Vietnam by the time Tycho departed for Japan in early December. Webster was part of the VA-56 attack squadron, known as the Champions. The Champs flew the A-4E, a highly upgraded version of the Skyhawk with a better engine, better avionics, and high-tech nav and radar instruments for the day. 
In addition to flying bombing runs into Vietnam, the champs were also trained in nuclear delivery, as outlined before. And as such, they were required to train with the weapons and learn their part of the various psyops to the T. Almost more important than the pilot's part in these exercises was the deck crew's part. The presence of a B-43 H-bomb changed things for everyone involved, and for starters, it was carefully supervised by armed marines, who went with the bomb wherever it might have gone, jealously guarding the doomsday device with M-16s in hand. The certified crewmen attached the bomb in the hangar, something not normally done but for the intense security needs of the weapon. The pilot and a technical monitor then go through a checklist before entering their own halves of a permissive action link code to unlock and arm the weapon. Finally, the pilot signs a receipt for the AEC and the weapon is in his hands. Just a quick aside, many pilots joked that the Stanley Kubrick black comedy masterpiece Dr. Strangelove was more documentary than fiction, specifically the part about being unable to recall nuclear armed planes once the PSYOP goes into action. If an A-4 pilot was screaming inland towards targets in China, there would likely be no way to call them back, and the pilot would be the only authority on whether or not the apocalypse would begin. Seriously, how the hell are we still here? But anyway, half of this nuclear loading process wasn't even meant to happen on the morning of December 5th, 1965. Nobody entered any PAL codes, and Doug Webster never signed a receipt. It was only meant to be a loading exercise, and that part at least went well, but things wouldn't be running so smoothly for long. Champ 472 was in hangar number 2, already loaded with a B-43 bomb. Tycho was on its way to Japan from Vietnam for some much-needed R&R and resupply, but that didn't mean the sailors could expect any breaks before getting to Yokosuka. Champ 472 was making its way across the hangar toward the number 2 elevator that would carry it to the flight deck, and once there, it wasn't even planned to launch. Just get ready to launch. A simple readiness exercise. A4Es were most often connected to mules, tractors essentially that pulled the planes to their destinations. But this time, Champ 472 would be manually pushed by a dozen crewmen. Not an uncommon sight, even today, and it is generally safe enough. This might be because the plane always had a pilot in the cockpit to ride the brakes and make sure the 12-ton bird didn't roll away. Sitting in the cockpit on that December morning was plane captain Bob Redding, who then passed the seat to airman Richard Edmister. But Edmister was not the pilot for this exercise, and he was about to give the stick over to Lieutenant Douglas Webster. The 6'6 airman yielded the cockpit to the 5'8 aviator and helped him buckle up before descending the ladder back to the hangar deck. The 12-man crew then began moving the A-4 toward the open-air elevator, tail first, with Doug's back toward the sea. Edmister had checked the brakes and everything was in order, but these crews didn't rely on the plane's systems alone. Two crewmen waited on either side of the aircraft with adjustable metal chocks to manually stop it if inertia took over, and a director oversaw the whole procedure with a whistle to signal the crewmen and pilot. These chocks would need to be thrown around the wheels at roughly the same time to effectively stop the aircraft. About this time, a signal goes up from the bridge. Tycho is making a slight turn to starboard and starts leaning toward the outside of the turn, pointing the Hangar 2 elevator slightly down toward the sea. The crewman first had to get the plane over a two-inch lip because the elevator wasn't quite flush with the deck. The crew took two tries to get the plane over the shallow wooden ramps, and finally Champ 472 was on the elevator. But it wasn't stopping. It was rolling fast, and Doug wasn't hitting the brakes, despite the blaring of whistles from the directors. In fact, this whole time he's been distracted by something in the cockpit, looking down, darting his eyes around as if focused on something else. The directors signal frantically at Webster to hold the brakes, but he wasn't looking at them. The chocks were thrown, and the right wheel stopped, but the left side didn't, causing the A4 to pivot on its right wheel before jumping the chocks and continuing its roll toward the edge of the elevator. Now Doug is alert, looking around and trying to respond, the plane is about to go over the edge, and Doug is pressing his hands against the canopy. The left wheel goes over the 6-inch guardrail, and Champ 472 begins its backward fall, briefly interrupted by the safety nets around the elevator. It stands straight up for the briefest moment before slapping into the waves on its back. The hangar crew rushes to the edge, seeing the white belly of the A4 disappear into the deep, with the B-43 nuke attached securely to its center line. Yeah. The plane, with the hydrogen bomb on it, simply fell off the elevator.
This could even have been comical in hindsight if not for the fact that Doug Webster went down with his plane, presumably drowning in the Philippine Sea. Rescue divers swam after the plummeting Skyhawk, but the weight of the bomb-laden plane pulled the craft quickly to the sea bottom. So how did this happen? How did a crew, plane, and pilot that had presumably done this exact procedure thousands of times screw up so royally? Well, the definitive answer will likely never be known, but there were plenty of contributing factors. Firstly, there was the human element. Crews worked truly dismal hours at back-breaking labor, stealing naps whenever they could, but despite the undoubtable fatigue, supervisors claimed their men were having an above-average day. Doug Webster as well was cleared for flight by the flight surgeon, and those that interacted with him said he was in good form for the exercise. Obviously, a crewman had failed to throw chocks accurately, but this could have been due to an equipment issue that we'll talk about in a sec. Doug was seemingly distracted by something in the cockpit, and one crewman even took time during the official inquiry to complain in general about pilots ignoring directors during movements. But Doug didn't even break when he realized what was happening, and no skid marks were found on the deck to indicate a brake failure of some kind. So if it wasn't entirely human error, it must have been mechanical, right? Maybe. Firstly, the brakes were confirmed functional by Captain Redding and Airman Edmister, so unless they had fully failed in a matter of moments, that couldn't have been it. It was determined that, for whatever reason, Doug just didn't use them. But what about the chocks? Was it the fault of a fatigued crewman who missed his mark? It could have been, but the interviewed sailors made it quite clear that the large metal chocks were slippery and tough to handle, and that the non-stick surfaces that they arrived with never lasted long under working conditions though the Inquiry Board's own counsel, Commander Smith, declared the chocks were in satisfactory condition. So, no help there. Then what the hell was it? Well, there is one final factor that might just tie a lot of the mystery together. I mentioned earlier that Airman Edmister was 6 foot 6, and that Lieutenant Webster was only 5 foot 8. Well, that's actually a really big deal here. Reason being, the brake pedals in the A4 are down by the pilot's feet, just like in a car, and the seat needed to be adjusted based on the height of the pilot. The only way to do this was by connecting the circuit to an outside generator, so if it didn't get adjusted before the plane started moving, it wasn't going to happen until the plane stopped. And if a short pilot jumped in the seat of a very tall person, then that pilot might not be able to reach the pedals. Yep, that may have been the big nasty sticking point of the whole incident. Webster was not tall enough to reach the pedals in the unadjusted cockpit. This would explain his distraction during the movement and even his pressing against the canopy, a desperate attempt to reach the pedals and stop the roll. But in the end, this was only one factor of many that likely caused the accident. Webster couldn't reach the pedals, he wasn't watching the directors, the ship was listing slightly, the chalk thrower missed, the skids had worn off, the guardrail was too short, and the net wasn't designed to stop a 12-ton jet. In short, bad luck broke this arrow. Doug's family, his wife, mother, and father were informed of his passing and told that he died during a loading exercise. This vague explanation would be all the indication the public would get to even remotely suggest a bomb had been lost. There was a rescue effort, though with the seafloor being 16,000 feet below the accident, there would be no salvage effort at least none that the public had ever been privy to. In fact, no one in the military or government seemed to care at all about the incident. President Johnson was informed about the missing nuke, but apparently went about his day like nothing had happened. He was at his ranch in Texas at the time, and according to the official log, he spent some time on the phone with his press secretary, but did little else. No official statement or orders came from the White House, but Johnson did make time to visit a neighbor to see their new litter of puppies. Oh, good for you! For the rest of the war, and even some time after, the tragedy of Webster's death was seen as nothing more than a freak accident of little consequence. It wouldn't be until 1981 that the truth finally came out, a result of a Freedom of Information Act request by Greenpeace activists writing a story on nuclear material in the oceans. The government, predictably, lied their asses off about the particulars of the incident and their response and cover-up. But when their feet were held to the flame, they did the next most predictable thing and tried to minimize the impact of the loss. I can only imagine the eye rolls and subtle annoyance 80s Americans felt watching the Pentagon spokesman sweat on TV after they just finished off a big rail. 
A subway rail, I mean. Like in New York. The story was embarrassing for the Navy at home, but it was a near catastrophe in Japan. Firstly, the incident happened only 80 miles away from the Japanese island of Kikaijima, causing concerns about contamination for the fish-reliant country. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, the U.S. might have violated Japanese law by bringing nuclear weapons onto their soil. For painfully obvious reasons, the people of Japan are quite sensitive to the subject of atomic weapons. And as such, they have banned their production, possession, and introduction onto Japanese soil. If Tycho had nukes on board during that winter cruise in 1965, and the cruise stopped in Japan right after the incident, then surely they had violated this law. We're sorry. At the very least, it would have been a dubious gray area, and keep in mind that Tycho was only one of 21 carriers that participated in the Vietnam War alone. So the odds that America slipped a nuke onto Japanese soil are, uh, pretty good, I'd guess. And the people of Japan were not happy to hear this. Protesters picketed the U.S. Embassy, demanding an end to the Mutual Cooperation Treaty between the two countries, claiming the U.S. was violating their laws and using their country to propagate a nuclear war. And perhaps they had a point. Though it should be said that the aforementioned treaty did allow for brief visits by nuclear-armed ships, and even if it didn't, the treaty certainly did not provide a way for the Japanese government to easily check up on American warships. Japan was, and is, a super important ally for the U.S., so the handling of this incident was no joke. Great efforts were made to satiate the angry people of Japan, but the rage level of the country was not so easily quelled. Politicians in the country even ran on a platform of enshrining and strengthening Japan's non-nuclear stance, and they used the incident to rally their bases to that cause. But in the end, the issue just sort of dissolved, with the Japanese government being unwilling to press the U.S. on it for fear of hurting relations with Washington. And the radiation threat, too, was deemed a non-issue by environmental scientists who tested the waters around the accident site and determined there was no rise in rad levels. But what about the bomb itself? What happened to it down there in the depths of the Pacific Ocean? Well, the official story had always been that the bomb must have broken up due to pressure long before it hit the ocean's floor. And this was somehow supposed to make everyone feel better. Despite the fact that the plutonium in the bomb has a half-life of something like 24,000 years. <gasps> and besides that, it was later discovered that similar weapons had survived depths deeper than the Tycho bomb, so the weapon could still be down there. Rumors abound as usual, involving Russians or Chinese salvage teams, but the official line from the US is as predictable as ever. The bomb may or may not have left the aircraft, and it may or may not have broken up upon sinking to the ocean floor. At the very least, we know it probably wasn't armed. Probably. Not every broken arrow involves harrowing, death-defying crashes, and desperate struggles for survival. Just like war, sometimes terrible things happen with little reason at all. Promising young men like Douglas Webster will defy flak fire and missiles, land jets on carriers at night time after time, just to die in a stupid accident. Nuclear bombs are the most destructive weapons humans have ever created, and humans are really great at screwing up. All things considered, the loss of Champ 472, the innocuous loss of the B-43 bomb it held, and even the senseless death of a talented aviator might just serve to remind us how lucky we really are. But will that luck ever run out? Thanks everyone for tuning in for another Broken Arrow. As we approach the end of 2022, I wanted to thank everyone who has subscribed during my three months of content creation. I'm thrilled at the response so far, and I can't wait to make more videos in the coming year. Happy New Year to all of you, and thanks for 100 subscribers. See you next time.